right, welcome to uh, 420 p.m. at At Party 2013. Uh, my name is Noah Vauder. Today I'm going to be talking about digital music instrument design with an emphasis on efficient algorithms. It's pretty interesting so far that there's been so many, uh, so many music projects today. I had no idea. It's, it's pretty exciting. Maybe next year everything will be video. I don't know. Or, or some other crazy medium. So I want to start off with uh, a story about the old days. Back in the late 80s was when I was in high school. And that's when modems were uh, just kind of making the jump from 1200 baud to 2400 baud, depending on your income level and, and stuff like that. And uh, back then, long distance was like a thing, you know? We used to call it LD with a capital L and a capital D. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to live in uh, southeastern Connecticut, which is where there's a huge naval base. So I assume that it was the, uh, the, the large numbers of engineers down there who worked for the Navy that uh, created the conditions where there were a lot of uh, bulletin board systems. That, and it was, just happened to be within my local area code so I could uh, call all these BBSs, and there were, there were tons of them. It, we were pretty lucky. Uh, I had a 2400 baud modem most of the time. And they were, they were just coming onto the scene to the point where uh, the, um, th there were a few people in my high school who actually ran their BBSs. I went to a, a high school with four grades, and there are 2,000 students total. Do the math. And uh, one kid in my high school uh, had a BBS. He ran it on his Atari 520 ST. He called it the Wizard's Castle. And he asked, he made a request back then and I'm going to honor it, that I only refer to him as The Wiz. So maybe I'll tell you a little story about The Wiz. <laughs> and so The Wiz was uh, really technologically advanced. He taught me a lot of what I know, including how to send email that wasn't just email within our BBS, but using some kind of relay where the BBSs call each other. I don't know the name of that. And another, do you know? Probably Vitonet. Yeah. Vitonet, yes, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. Of course, I didn't know anybody anywhere else because I couldn't call LD and I didn't steal credit cards or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, the, the, another thing that the Wiz did one day was he sent me a multimedia file. He sent me a, <laughs> he sent me a sound sample. So at the time, you know, nowadays it's like, yeah, you just click attach, every single program does it, use an email program for the first time. Back then it was, it was a huge dramatic event, you know, how big is this thing? Will it reach me? Will I be able to play it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he sent me this email file. Uh, I, I loaded it up, I believe I used Audio Master 3 on my Amiga. And when I got the file loaded, it's, uh, it, was a, it was the whiz talking in a low pitched voice saying, the chain is rusted and stiff. So, so what, what the hell is that all about? <laughs> That's a reference to uh, a video that another friend from the BBS scene uh, in my high school and I, another kid, Nate, uh, we, we made a video for some class project complaining. We invented a project, it was called Nose Grease. His, his dad introduced us to the idea, you have like a little eraser scum on an envelope, so you take a little bit of nose grease and you wipe it on there and, the, and it goes away. So then we thought, well, why not try, we had to do an advertisement as a, as a class project. So we made this advertisement and we said, oh, you know, I got this terrible bicycle. Uh, the, the chain is all rusted and stiff. And I guess that just stuck in the mind of the whiz. <laughs> So he gave me, he, he sent me this file, and I opened it up, and I said, sure, I'll try and play this. And I listened to it over and over again, because that's what you did, right? I mean, in the old days, when you got a picture in the email or on a disc somehow, you stared at that picture, and you got to know it, because it, you know, who knows how long, like, it was a big deal just to have a picture. So I'm gonna do a quick uh, live recording. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what I experienced. Yeah, just making sure. This is Audacity open source audio program. It's definitely your friend. 
Although it can be a bit naggy. Okay. The chain. The chain. Yeah. That, that was not intended. <laughs> the, chain the chain is rusty. It's rusty. It's rusty. It's rusty. It's rusty. It's rusty. <laughs> This is what I ended up doing for, for maybe an hour or something that day. I just looked at this one, one place in the sample where it said the word chain. It, it, does anyone, everyone sees how there's a repeated waveform up there, right? It just goes A. That, that, that was a magical moment for me. Because I realized, okay, you look at the A and it has a certain shape. You look at all the other stuff and it has different shapes. And I, I started putting two and two together and I said, oh my God, this, every sound has a different shape. And then furthermore, this is just a list of numbers inside the computer. And I said, my God, every list of numbers has a different sound. So that means, could it possibly mean that you can just come up with uh, patterns, lists of numbers, and create sounds with them. And I'm here to tell you today that yes, you can in fact be creative with patterns of numbers and express music through them. I'm going to show you a handful of different ways that I've seen people in my personal experience do this to great effect. There's uh, three, three algorithms in particular called the, the ROT synth. We're going to talk a little bit about LFSRs and then uh, another synthesizer called the one bit groove box. There's one other demo too. So first I want to show you something that actually one of my collaborators, Nick, showed earlier today. Just shows you how, how uh, prolific and, and powerful this one demo is. This is a one line C program that uh, a guy from the demo scene wrote about a year and a half ago that makes music. Uh, this is actually, I'm going to show you his second iteration. I think Nick showed you the first today. All right, I'm going to skip around just a little bit because this one file has a couple other similar equations that make quite different sounds. Ahem. All right. Well, life's too short for crappy software. So let's keep moving on. I'm going to show you an algorithm called Rot Synth. This is invented by a friend of mine named Ethan Bordeaux. Uh, I made friends with Ethan uh, in the mid-90s or so. I had gotten something called the uh, Easy Kit Lite, which is a DSP development kit from the company Analog Devices. It was the kind of thing that they, they, they started doing this, I, I don't know when, we're in an explosion of development kits nowadays. Back then, I guess it was a little bit rarer. And you were supposed to uh, test your application, develop it on there before you make your final board. And it had a bunch of sound examples. There was some other hardware at the time called uh, the Chameleon that lets you write your own algorithms. That was a line out effects processor. Uh, I couldn't afford it at the time, although I, I could have just as easily been doing that. So the way RotSynth works, Ethan starts with a 16-bit random number. And so a number from 0 to 65,535, and he sends that out to a 16-bit digital to analog converter. Then on the next clock tick, he rotates the word using a, uh, a rotate operation, so that, such that uh, the, uh, the most significant bit pops out in the LSB position. And he keeps doing that, so that means that every uh, every sample has exactly 16 steps because each time you rotate through that loop 16 times, you're back where you started. I got a little spreadsheet demo of that. Is that looking up there? Okay, I can see the graph.
All right, so this is a, a depiction of the process in real time with uh, Google Spreadsheets. So you can see I start up there, the starting value is one. In the next iteration, we just shift around to two, four, eight, 16, blah, blah, blah. This is an eight bit version. Once we hit 256, that's too big. So uh, that eighth bit wraps around to the one. And that's why we get this repeating pattern here. So the way Ethan does it is you just pick a random value here uh, any random value from 0 to 255, anyone? 147. Gotcha. 147. <laughs> okay, see, we get a totally different waveform over there. It's got kind of like three different spikes in it. Uh, so uh, that, that's the way Ethan was, was making synthesizers. And I want to show you just, I'll play you a little bit of uh, what that sounds like used on one of his albums called Etsy versus Etsu DSP Music Volume 1. You're going to hear a lot of the same uh, waveform triggered, but it's going to be just a little bit different every time because he's picking a different random seed each time. up for a little while. It's a, it's a really nice tune. So uh, I talked to Ethan about this algorithm for a little while and I said, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of control over this. And a lot of the random values actually sound the same. And he said, what do you mean? Why, why is that? And I said, well, let's look. If you start with the value one, for example, then you get that waveform. But if you start with two, you get the same uh, waveform again. Oops, I guess I mistyped there. Yeah. There we go. So if you start with two, you get the same waveform. It's just kind of shifted. Four is going to give you the same, uh, what I call, problem. And then there are other issues, too. There's, if you start with 85, for example, this gives you a certain periodicity. Oh, it should come on. Oh, yeah, is that? Oh, I overrode it. Okay, let's see if we can go back to where it's. Yeah, that one's good. Thank you. So, for example, the number 85 has a, a periodicity of 2. You see, 85 turns into 170, 170 turns into 340, 340 is greater than 256, so it reverts back. So, there. I wanted to organize this, uh, this system a little bit. And I said, how many unique waveforms are there? So I ended up doing something where uh, I made a sieve. I said, there's a whole bunch of equivalent uh, waveforms out there. How many are actually unique? And it turns out that for any n-bit space, about 2 to 3% of the space is actually unique waveforms. So for example, if you think about uh, the 16-bit space, there should be 65,000 unique waveforms. Turns out there are about 2% about of them actually sound unique due to the phase shifts, inverting, and reversal, and all combinations of those. And I made uh, an algorithm to sieve those. It's not particularly clever algorithm. It just uses a large amount of memory and invalidates all the cells. And then I packaged that into a musical instrument. That instrument is called the one-bit groove box. Uh, I don't really... I don't really like making music on computers as much. I like, I prefer to, to do them on instruments. So I'm gonna give you an example of what this sounds like. Okay, so that's a, that's a bass note. Now I'm gonna walk through some of the waveforms with the same fundamental pitch.
So that's another example of a, a kind of ad hoc algorithm that I just came up by chatting with my friend uh, and eventually made it into computer code and was able to make uh, an instrument out of it. So out of the one bit groove box came, I had a, a bunch of people who liked it. I taught workshops and, and put together a kit and stuff like that. You can still look online on my website and find the instructions for it. But people started asking me, hey Noah, why don't you make a drum machine? Make, instead of a one bit groove box, make a one bit drum machine. So I said, oh, that sounds so rad. It took me about two years. Uh, I had prototypes get stolen, and it, it's never come to the market. I haven't made a, a, a kit for it yet. I just, there's only about three of them in the world. But uh, I'm going to play you, one of, my, one of my users recorded a demo for me. I'll give you a feel for what that sounds like. Again, this is one-bit synthesis using the um, mo mostly stuff in the one-bit groove box. So that's a project that uh, I'm looking to resume because it's really encouraging to hear uh, your instruments, hear the sound come back to you. My main motive for doing this is I just want to hear the sounds. So I end up making some music myself, but I do a lot of research to try and share and get this stuff out to people so they can use it in their music. Uh, while we're talking about one-bit synthesis, I just want to, uh, you, you kind of have to mention the concept of an LFSR, also known as a linear feedback shift register. These are used in the uh, excellent Atari 2600 VCS. This is, um, I, don't, I don't have time to get d as, as deep into the math in this, but there's actually a very excellent Wikipedia page. You know how some Wikipedia pages are just so good, it makes you want to cry. The LFSR one is that it has two ways to do LFSRs, stuff I didn't even know about. Uh, I've got some prototype code on another computer just, just waiting to make its way out into there. But I wanted to play you one example of what, um, what the LFSR style music can, can do. This is a, a track I made using uh, an Atari 2600 sound chip emulator. Just took the, the sound chip routine out of the emulator code and put a little sequencer around it. While we're at it, uh, there's, there's ever more one-bit techniques. As time goes on, people are finding more and more ways to just toggle that one bit in clever ways. Has anyone here ever heard of a system called Channel F? Ah, OK. I was wondering if it was a vast internet conspiracy against me, because uh, I, I used to think I knew all these old systems. And, and, and I guess the Channel F, I think, was from 1978 
had an extremely limited sound generator. 76? 76. 76. So, so I was one years old at the time. <laughs> But still you have people, I guess this guy, Buddha, or maybe that's the name of his program, went back and wrote a sequencer for it. If I understand it right, and please jump in if I, if I don't get it, but I think the thing could only produce square waves at three different frequencies. But somehow these people managed to make it uh, produce a much wider uh, range of songs. There's another artist out there I'm buddies with named Tristan Parrich, who's produced something called One Bit Symphony. This is where you buy a CD and you press play and it's like a music box. That's actually something that uh, Ethan Bordeaux was, was thinking up. And there's another guy uh, from the demo scene. Does anyone know Mr. Bleep? Yeah! <laughs> play, beeper, play. Uh, this is going to be online later, so you can go and, and track down some of these artists. Mr. Bleep makes music using the Timex Sinclair 1000. He's out in Poland. One time I wrote to him and I said, dude, you have to come to the US. We, we have to get you on tour. Everyone has the year. And he's just like, no, I'm poor and broke. I'm in Poland. All I do is make one bit music. <laughs> oh, so while we're talking about all this and, and how it relates to the demo scene, I wanted to, uh, there's, there's this idea of economy, of efficiency and elegance and expediency of a platform. Um, it, it seems like there's a, a, a need or a tendency or a perpetual habit of musicians to make music out of everything that's just around them. You know, for a while it used to be a big deal. You'd say someone said, ah, oh, look, this guy made a sequencer out of the channel F. And now it's just like everyone's making uh, synthesizers out of everything. And, th and that, that totally fascinates me because there's... There's, if you look at commercial music hardware, it's often just a little bit behind the times. Notoriously in the 90s, storage media for groove boxes and samplers and things always seemed to use the last generation of storage media. Uh, like, you know, the ASRX came with a floppy drive. The sample track ST224 came with five volt smart media. It just keeps going on and on. And, and I think that's because there's, there's kind of two threads of instrument development. There's the the commercial thread, which just kind of seeks to capitalize, uh, the, the, there's a term for it I read called transsectorial innovation, which means that uh, one consumer line of products just inherits a whole bunch of the advantages of the other stuff. So it's, it means that people are not designing components to be used in music instruments. They're saying, oh, I can make a music instrument out of these commercially available components. And then, and th those are the people who are always late to the game, but then there's your people who are just sort of uh, they're the, the demo scene people, they're the experimental musicians who are making things out of just whatever they can as fast as possible. I got a few more examples of that, but first I want to just relate it back to, I think someone else earlier this morning was talking about just ancient music instrument pra practices before music history. People made instruments out of just whatever they have. Recently people discovered a flute that was laying around. Uh, they found it in Germany, I think it's 40,000 years old. Uh, I read another book that says hunting bows have always been instruments. Um, they're just expedient for what people use. You know, have a stick and some kind of line. Uh, so there's, there, uh, even today there's, um, I was talking about the development board before the Easy Kit Lite. There's a chip out there from uh, ST Microelectronics called the STM 32F4. They released a board for it called the Discovery. Does that, I see a smile. Does anyone know this board? For, oh, for Jupiter and beyond? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Mad props, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so th this, is, this is a sort of general purpose microcontroller, but for whatever reason, people are just compelled to give this thing video output and to give it audio output. So I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm gonna play a little bit of this that shows uh, some of the economical tricks that people use. So this is a scene uh, 30 seconds into the demo where, if I, if I understand the description properly, uh, th th this chip, as awesome as it is, is powerful. It's 168 megahertz, it's got a floating point unit, but it doesn't have a lot of RAM in it. So the person wanted to make a, uh, a delay buffer. So what they did is they resampled the delay buffer to uh, down to eight bits from 16 and down to, I believe, 22 or 10 kilohertz from the 40 kilohertz. And it gives it a nice crunchy sound that I only heard 
back in the 80s on some like delay units that uh, must have done something similar to stretch the memory. So just listen to the echo and just kind of listen to the timbre of it here. Okay, the demo is definitely worth checking out in its own right. Uh, it's from 2013, that's actually the second major STM32 F4 demo. And I love that chip so much, I decided I'm going to be using it for the next five years as my main embedded platform for making instruments. Uh, there was one other instance a few years ago, I don't have any visuals on this, but there was a, uh, you know, the Sony PlayStation Portable, the PSP. When that was released, it was one of the most intense cat and mouse games I've ever witnessed firsthand. Uh, I think the only thing that must have come close was maybe some of the Commodore scene in the, in the early 80s with, uh, with, the, with the crackers there. Uh, someone released a, a full-fledged demo with, with music and graphics. It was Wob from Alone Trio, who I believe is in France. And they released the source code for it. And I said, nice. And the nice thing about that source code was it included everything you needed to do to make graphics on the PSP and everything you needed to do to make sound. So I went ahead and I just wrote a full-fledged drum machine, released it, got my best friend, uh, the guy I made the Chain is Rusted and Stiff video with. He did the graphics for it. So there's definitely a tendency for people to, to grab onto to new platforms and, uh, and, and implement instruments on them. And it just, it just fascinates me, and, uh, and, and, and I like doing it. So I've talked a little bit about algorithms. Uh, I'm trying to, I run a website now called DIYDSP.com, and I'm trying to communicate to people, teach people how to build music instruments, because like I said, I'm not a fan of sitting behind a computer all day doing the composition. I like more traditional instrument styles. So I wanted to just give you uh, just a quick tutorial of what really goes into an electronic instrument. So I, I compose this basic model here. If, you, if you're playing with bone or a stick or something, then your instrument is one uniform material. It's just a piece of wood. It's just a piece of bone. Uh, but uh, the, the, when, you, when you make instruments, you have to have four major things. You have to have some kind of controls. You have to have some kind of synthesizer, CPU. Notice you can use one transistor, like a stylophone, or you can use five billion, like a, an AMD Radeon card. You have to have some kind of output. There's a bunch of digital formats, a bunch of analog formats. You really have to decide uh, based on the context that you're going to use the instrument in. And finally, you have to have some kind of body. Uh, notice how for this one, I just used a, a VHS cassette box. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So here's my animation. Up here, I've got, got those four components. I've got the keyboard, the synth controls, power source, and the synthesizer. Notice how we move them into the instrument body and I've been focusing on the synthesizer. So uh, a long time ago when I was making the algorithm for one bit synthesis, I, I knew I wanted some kind of portable instrument, but I didn't know what I want. I drew all these sketches, you know, stayed up late, drew all these things on napkins, envelopes, uh, graph paper, etc. But then I had uh, an important visitor coming to see me at the uh, research lab where I worked at. He was a, a visiting uh, musician named Ryoji Ikeda. Does anybody know Ryoji Ikeda? He, he's, he's one of those international uh, sound artist musicians, kind of guy who makes sound where he rents out a theater and then puts a speaker in one corner and plays sine waves so that you walk around the place. It's really sound arty and stuff. And it was, it was that day, he was coming in at 11, I said, oh my god, all I have is a pile of electronics, kind of like this. How am, I gonna, how am I gonna make this into an instrument? What am I gonna do? And uh, I poked around and I've, I noticed that there was this uh, video cassette my old roommate had loaned me. He was like, oh, it's really trippy, you gotta watch it at some point. And it just kind of moved with me as on a shelf, so I, I ripped it out and I uh, mounted it in here. And it turns out that VHS cassettes are really groovy for making uh, all kinds of electronic instruments because they're easy to work with, they're inexpensive if you break them, they're about hand size. You can open and close them, you can get clear ones so you can see right through. So I highly recommend VHS cassette boxes for all kinds of instruments and maybe other things too.
I, uh, when I taught workshops on how to build these, some of the people went off and they went to make other kinds of instruments in there. So I want to show you some of the diversity. These are just some different uh, electronic music instruments people have made inside uh, VHS cassette boxes. You could decorate them. Uh, eventually, somebody from my workshop uh, wrote me an email and said, hey, did you know my mom owns a video store? And we're like switching to DVD. Do you want the old VHS boxes? So I got a bunch of them now. Uh, and look at that. You can just stick them all on the shelf. It's, it's pretty groovy. Mm -hmm. Notice how this one here, it even has like a little label, you know? So uh, what, what turned from uh, an emergency event for me became kind of a, uh, something that other people wanted to repeat because it was useful to the point where here's another project uh, uh, some buddies of mine Jeff Warren in the public laboratory it's a uh, sort of an educational project that they fund over Kickstarter and stuff they just decided to design a spectrometer the kind of thing where uh, you hold it up to different lights and teach kids about the different wavelengths and things and they decided to use a video cassette box for that uh, as well so I, I say you know, what else can you do? Like, my mom loves to cover cigar boxes with different colored stamps. I say just, just go crazy, because the instrument body is like a huge part of it, uh, getting the aesthetics of the instrument correct, in addition to the sound. So I, I'm about to wrap up. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the fact that there's no real digital instrument platform currently. There's no generic thing. There's a lot of spread out projects. There's a lot of Arduino music projects. There's uh, an open source distortion pedal coming out. There's my own open source distortion pedal. There's a lot of stuff, but there's nothing that's quite like uh, uniform out there. And it turns out as radical as everyone is in making up all these crazy algorithms, decorating the, the groovy boxes, um, coming out with an instrument that's gonna survive from generation to generation is a humongous challenge. We go through thousands of iterations. And I like to think about this maybe because time is actually beneficial to composers and to players. I mean, look at the evolution of the guitar, uh, even xylophone and all the, the common traditional instruments. Uh, even the theremin, a lot of people say, hey, you do electronic instruments, have you ever heard of the theremin? <laughs> oh, only every day of my life. <laughs> uh, that, that instrument is over 100 years old. There's a great documentary on it, it's fascinating. And uh, yeah, so, um, and that one is just barely becoming part of our traditional canon. I mean, you can see how the saxophone slowly became part of the traditional orchestra. Uh, there's a French instrument called the Onde Martino, which is an electronic instrument that's slowly also becoming part of a standard orchestra. But the bottom line is that no one really knows what's going to happen. So always remember that. And then this is just a bonus. I talked a lot about oscillators that are very easy to implement. Um, this, I, someone posted this on a news group I, I was on. This is a state variable filter, or an SVF. This is the same exact filter style that's implemented on the Commodore 64's excellent SID chip. It's used in thousands of synthesizers. And this is the entire code for it. Uh, uh, go ahead, copy this down or get it. You pipe your signal into the in variable. You set your FC variable from zero to one for the lowest to the highest frequency. And you set your res damp from zero to one. Um, that's just the inverse of resonance. So if you wanted a high resonance of 0.9, your resonance damping is 0.1. And then you have three variables, L, B, and H. Anyone guess what L, B, and H means? Low pass, output, back pass, output, Exactly, low pass, band pass, high pass. When you hear synthesizers going that's a, that's a state variable filter, and you're usually hearing the band pass with the resonance cranked way up. Okay, uh, we'll open up for questions. I just want to leave you with my website. Go ahead, check it out. I'm trying to become like a super 2001 style information portable for all digital music instrument uh, design. And I'll take questions. Oh, I forgot there's one other demo too. Let's see. All right, Mike, it's time for this guy here. I wanted to kind of show you uh, like I said, I don't like doing things tethered to PCs and stuff, so I took that algorithm uh, that was made by Viznut and I compiled it into one of those STM32F4 uh, chips. I got a little demo board down here and I put this button on it. Yeah, okay. Do you, re do you recognize this? 
And then just to make it more instrument-like, I added a pitch knob here. So we're, we're taking his thing out of the area of a demo on YouTube. We're making it into an actual battery-powered instrument with a line out. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right, if, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, I'm gonna, my, my printer wasn't working well here. As I printed out my contact info. I'll cut you off a slice so you can send me an email or something. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I'm trying to get as much source code as I possibly can all the time. The only thing that limits me is time. And when people send me requests, and I'll go, yeah, sure, I'll just put that right up for you. So yeah, it's, it's all about trying to share stuff as much as possible. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to post this, uh, the STM32F4 version of, uh, of this of BizNuts program. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I, uh, I guess you could say I was heavily influenced by circuit bending, although before I learned what circuit bending was, I was trying to make uh, instruments. Um, I'm friends with a lot of people in the circuit bending community. Uh, I like to go down and hang around at Bentfest in New York City. Um, I've bent maybe just like two things. My TR-50 or 626 drum machine. I didn't do a very Im impressive bend there or something, but... Uh, yeah, certainly uh, circuit bending is, is, is very near and dear uh, topic to the uh, idea of, of um, digital music instrument making. In fact, one of the interesting things is with circuit bending, you kind of start out with a random process of exploration. Oh, what wires can I combine together in this electronic instrument to make different sounds? But when I was talking about the evolution of instruments, it turns out that there are certain bends that are recurring, that people make over and over again because they're predictable and they make interesting sounds. Uh, for example, the Casio, is it, what's that sampling keyboard? SK1. There's, there's a more or less standard set of bends that you can do on the Casio SK1. Also, the Texas Instruments speaking spell. A lot of people have really mapped that thing out very well. So I'm very interested, I'm, I'm concerned because uh, circuit bending stuff is made out of this generation's consumer products. So if enough of those consumer products don't survive into the next generation, then how are we going to be able to recreate those sounds? So, uh, I mean, that's my concern. So it's, that's why I like to try and find out how these things work and say, oh God, you know, it's 2040. We've got a, a symphony to perform and there are no speaking spells left inside the whole entire world. <laughs> What do, we, what do we do? Let's see. I mean, we know we'll, have, we'll be able to simulate it. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, a large part of research is just going around behind weirdo musicians and, uh, uh, I mean that in a loving way, and, and trying to just write down what they're doing. Hackers are very much related to journalists. That's a huge tangent. Thank you. Right, any other questions? All right, people. Has anyone ever been to a demo party tonight uh, a bit before? Because this this is gonna this is gonna rock your ass tonight. This is gonna be awesome. I, I don't know if everyone understands the the full uh, implications of of how badass a demo party can really be. Uh, I was one of those people who raised their hands as never having been in Europe, but I've been watching the. Uh, watching it take place across the continent for me for like 10 or 20 years. It's so exciting. So I think I'm really grateful to be here at At Party and just uh, for, for what we're about to experience tonight. So I have a lot of fun. Just check